In the arms here. So what do you want to do in the arms? BP. BP. You want to check his BP monitoring. Okay, so make sure that it's connected to your BP monitoring. You want to possibly co have a continuous monitoring of his BP. Okay, every 15 minutes you want to check his BP. The staff tells you someone post cardiac arrest. Now the staff has informed you that the BP is dropped. Doctor, the BP is 80 over 50. What should I do? Okay, you start shaking a bit. Okay, <laughs> you start having butterflies in the stomach. Okay, but you need to do something. Okay, what is what is next? What are you going to do? Call for help. Very good. Yes. Call for help. Okay, you call your registrar. Unfortunately, your registrar is busy attending another case. He asked you to stabilize first as much as you can. So what are you going to do next? Okay, you're going to pray to the heavens. Okay, next. What are you going to do? Check the monitor. Okay, you're thinking it's a technical problem. Very good. Okay, but the calf is correct. You have repeated the calf. Now you have searched manually, you have measured manually, and the BP is still low. You straight away want to start inotropes. Very good. You want to start inotropes. Yes, yes, it's it's a good answer. You can start inotropes, but sometimes you must remember patient's blood pressure may drop a little bit because of your sedative and analgesic effects. Drugs like morphine can drop the blood pressure because of your histamine release in the peripheral circulation. All right. Sometimes there's so many reasons blood pressure can drop, okay? Sometimes patient may have been dehydrated because of all the resuscitation effort. So because of that, sometimes we can start low fluid boluses. Maybe 200 cc over 20 to 30 minutes, okay? You start a small amount of fluid bolus and see whether the blood pressure picks up or not, okay? So you start a small fluid bolus, not too much, because remember, cardiac arrest, the heart may be weak. So if you give too much fluid, patient may go into fluid overload and you're going to end up killing the patient if the patient goes into fluid overload. So you give a small amount of fluid, but in small boluses, okay? You give 200 cc of fluid bolus. Warm, huh? remember, always remember, warm, never use cool, okay? So you use warm saline, 200 cc. Then BP still doesn't improve. The nurse calls you back. Doctor, the BP is still low. What shall I do? And looks at you with the eyes of worry. Okay? So what do you do next? Jump out the ambulance. What? Okay, okay. Come on, what is that? Okay. At this stage, when it does not respond to fluid, you need to start patient on inotropes. Okay? There's so many forms of inotropes. Okay? Inotropes itself warrants for another class. Okay, okay. One of inotropes first warrants for another class. But according to the American Heart Association guideline, somebody post cardiac arrest if the BP is low below 90 over 60, you can immediately start noradrenaline followed by dobutamine. Okay, why you cannot start? Why do they start these two immediately? Noradrenaline and dobutamine. Why just start one, maximize one, then start the other one and maximize? Why is it you start both together at a lower rate and bring them up together? Why? Yes, they act on different receptors. Where does noradrenaline act? Ne noradrenaline acts on the alpha-1 receptors in the peripheral circulation. Okay, so they squeeze the peripheral circulation and increase the venous return to the heart. Okay, so because of that, the heart gets more blood, the heart can pump more blood, increase the cardiac output. Okay, so that's how, that's how noradrenaline works. How about dobutamine? How does dobutamine work? Yes, it acts on beta-1 receptors. It increases the heart contractility all right so you have increased blood going to the heart and increased contractility of the heart via this beta 1 receptors so more blood goes to the periphery so these two work synergistically hand in hand so that is why patients post cardiac arrest bp low you want to start dobutamine and noradrenaline early okay early so that the blood pressure goes up because you don't want the patient to go into what kind of shock cardiogenic, cardiogenic shock is bad if patient persistently in cardiogenic shock then he will go into irreversible shock, then patient will pass away. So you want to make sure that the blood pressure is kept steady during a post resus care. If you allow the patient to go into shock, then his mortality is going to go even higher. Okay? So remember, address the blood pressure immediately. Do not wait. Okay? Alright. So you start inotropes. Yes? Doctor, this inotropes given infusion or IV? Okay, these are always given in infusion. Inotropes are always given in infusion. Okay? There are stat... Uh, there are stat... Uh, BP uh, increasing agents that we can give but in general we start them on infusion okay sometimes we do give a small bolus and then followed by infusion okay it's uh, 
uh, I will go into another class as well on how to on inotropes, just on inotropes, okay? How to prepare the inotropes, how to give the infusion, how one inotrope differs from the rest. It's a whole big topic on its own, okay? All right, next. After arms, arms is settled. You have managed to secure the blood pressure. Congratulations. What is next? Okay, from the arms, you move down to the peripheries. You move down to the peripheries. When you meet someone for the first time in your life, okay, what is the first thing you do? Handshake. Say hi. Say hi, yes. Okay, hi. Okay. And what then what is next? Smile. Smile, okay. Smile. Okay, you show your beautiful white Colgate teeth. Okay. And what do you do next? Shake, shake hands. Shake hands. Correct. Hey, hi. How are you? Okay. Shake hands, yeah? You're fine, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. All right, all right. Okay. You shake hands, right? So the first thing you do when you meet someone is you shake hands. And what is so important about the shaking hands? What happens when you touch somebody's hands? Nothing. <laughs> Come on, there is more than that. We are connected, we are human beings, we are all so connected. When you touch somebody's hands, what happens? <laughs> Electric shock. <laughs> Brother, who exactly you are shaking hands with? <laughs> I don't know, maybe you have electric eels as friends, I don't know. Okay, alright. You see, when you shake hands for the first time, you form a bond. Okay? <laughs> if it's from the opposite sex, you will start... Oh, oh no, sir. <laughs> So he said, so, oh, no, okay, cannot touch the hands of opposite sex, all right, okay, if you do, one day, touch the hands of the opposite sex, okay, what happens is that, oxytocin is released, oh. yes, oxytocin is released and immediately there is a bond, and if you two are connected, then the bond for life has already been formed, okay, oh. can you, okay. <laughs> Can you see how important handshakes are? Okay? And even among friends, among your own gender, alright? You can form lifelong relationships just by touching someone's hands. Okay? All the chemical reactions, all your oxytocin and dopamine and what so not. Okay? It is the same thing for patients. I'm not asking you to touch the patient's hand and form a lifelong bond. No. Yes. Some, uh, some uh, medical practitioners do form lifelong bonds with their patients. Yes. But you see, for us, the story starts with the handshake. For the patient, our story with him also starts with the handshake. Why? Why did I bring up this point? You see, when you shake, when you touch a patient's hand, okay? I'm touching his hand, okay? I'm touching his hands, alright? First and foremost, what am I doing? I'm forming a bond with him. He may be intubated and sedated, but I'm talking to him and I'm pretty sure he knows I'm there, alright? Okay? I found a bond, bond with him. So he feels secure with his patient-doctor relationship. He knows that he is in good hands, hopefully. Okay? <laughs> Alright, and the second thing, what am I doing? Yeah. While I am holding the hands, you see, doctors are always people with... We always do two things. I mean, we always want, you know... There's always a hidden agenda. Correct? <laughs> we need, with doctors, there's always hidden. When we shake hands, we want to say hi, but at the same time, there's a hidden agenda. What we start doing? We start doing detective work. Okay? Just by holding the hands, do you know how much information you can get? What are you looking for when you touch somebody's hands? Cold and clammy. Are you supposed to be cold and clammy? What does cold and clammy mean? Patient could be in shock. Although the blood pressure is normal, but if it's cold and clammy... Okay, all of you are in shock now because it's very cold. Okay, it's a different kind of shock. It's shock CDD. Okay? Alright. Okay. But, when you touch the peripheries, what are you looking for? If it's cold and clammy means patient could be, if the blood pressure is normal, but patient is cold and clammy, what does it mean? Heart rate is tachycardic. Patient could have compensated shock. All the peripheral circulation is being moved to the central circulation. And because of that, the peripheries are lack of blood, and because patient may appear cold and clammy. That is a very bad sign. Shock should be caught in compensated shock, not in decompensated shock. Okay? You remind me, another class for shock. A lot of classes, okay? All right. So cold and clammy, something is wrong. Compensated, you have to do something, bring the BP, uh, blood, you have to make sure that the peripheries are warm again. What else is next besides swimming for cold and clammy? Pulse. pulse, what about the pulse? Regular. If it's weak, low volume, thready pulse also tells you that this patient is in shock. Okay? Correct. Never trust the BP. BP monitoring is Justin Bieber. Okay? <laughs> Alright? Should not be trusted upon. Okay? So you must always rely on your clinical. Feel the pulse volume. If the pulse volume is weak, thready, could tell you that patient is shocked. What else about the hands? There's too many information about the hands. CRT. 
CRT, squeeze the fingernails. Release. Look at the CRT. If the CRT is more than two seconds, also tells you the patient is in shock. What else? For children. Skin turgor. Reduce skin turgor. It also gives you a clue that patient could be very dehydrated, could be in shock as well. Okay? Anything else? Anything else? Okay, so I repeat. For the hands, you want to look at the pulse volume, you want to look at the CRT, cold clammy peripheries, and the... I mean, you want to see whether it's cold clammy peripheries, and also the CRT, okay, less than two seconds. There's so much, that, that much information you can get just by feeling the hands. And by feeling the hands, trust me, within years of experience of working in the emergency, when you touch somebody's hands, you know that this person will really need your help. Okay? Seriously, I kid you not. When you touch somebody's hands, you know they're in trouble and they're crying for your help. So you will have to hold their hands, tell them and assure them, don't worry, you're in safe hands, I will help you. Okay? I'll be your pillar of hope. Okay? Aww. Clap hands, come on! Yeah, self-glorified, huh? Okay. Alright, so, but, 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 please, please, please. What I'm trying to tell you is, please touch the hands. Feel the hands. The hand tells you so much more information. And, if you save him, you will form a lifelong bond with your patient. Your patient will forever remember you. Okay? Now. Okay. What, so, we have gone from arm to the hands, fingers. Okay? Where next now? Bladder. Okay, from here, we move to the bladder. Not too low, huh? a bit higher. Bladder. Okay? <laughs> Alright. Bladder. Okay. So, what are you looking for in the bladder? CBD. We insert a CBD and look for urine, urine output. output. We are the only professions, okay, in the world... We're so happy when somebody actually urinates. <laughs> yes, when somebody urinates, we're so happy. Oh, thank God he's urinating. Alright? Why? Because that is how important urine output is. What urine output you're aiming for? <laughs> 0 0.5 cc per kg per hour. Roughly around 30 cc. If the patient is around 60 kilograms, ideal body weight. This amount of urine is very important. If the urine output, despite your resuscitation, you have started the patient on... Okay, sorry. Regarding the hands, there's one more thing I forgot. In the hands as well, don't forget, you need to secure the IV lines as well. Because mm -hmm. sometimes when patient is resus in, during resuscitation, the lines can be difficult to insert. Or we insert a very small uh, ball branula. So you need to reinsert, put large ball branulas and secure the lines. Okay? And another thing, don't forget, you may want to insert intra-arterial lines as well. Okay? Alright. So make sure the lines are secure. Okay. Now... Where was I just now? CBD? Bladder. Bladder. Okay. You have... Okay. Oh, yes, yes. Sorry. Short, short memory span. Okay. Alright. Now, you have already addressed the blood pressure. Okay. You have already... When you check the peripheries, don't forget patient need to be started on maintenance as well. Okay. Don't forget. Huh? One, more, one more point about the peripheries is maintenance. Start patient on fluid maintenance. Okay. So, you have started patient on fluid maintenance. You have started inotropes. But the... Urine output is still low. Still, you can't achieve the low. You can't achieve the urine output that you want. Still less than 30 cc per hour. What is going through going through in your mind? What could be the problem? Patient may have acute kidney injury. All right, why? You see, cardiac output will give blood to. Okay, the highest blood goes to your liver. Liver, 30 percent. Liver takes the most blood from cardiac output. Followed by? Renal. renal. Yes. After liver is renal. Okay? Leave, uh, renal is almost 20 to 25%. That much cardiac output it needs. So you imagine your patient is going to cardiogenic shock, what is going to be affected besides the liver? The kidneys. So if patient does not produce enough urine, means there's not enough blood perfusing the kidneys, not enough urea is being formed, not enough urine is being formed, there's not enough urine coming out, it means that the cardiac output is affected. So you need to do whatever it takes to increase the cardiac output to make sure that the kidneys are not injured. Because if there's less blood going to the kidneys, kidneys are going to get injured. From acute kidney injury, is going to go to a chronic problem. So you don't want the patient to lose his kidneys. Understand? So you want to increase the perfusion. So how do you increase this perfusion to the kidneys? So many ways. If the problem is with the heart, you increase the contractility of the heart. Give anatomy. If the problem is with the volume, there's not enough volume. Patient is dehydrated. Increase the amount of fluid given so that the fluid will so that the fluid will 
uh, increase the perfusion to the kidneys. Okay. If the pro if the problem is with oxygenation, you want if the problem is blood, patient doesn't have any enough circulating blood. Patient is bleeding. Okay, you just secure the bleed. Okay, in trauma patients, you want to increase the blood so that there's enough hemoglobin sending oxygens. Okay, sending oxygen and there's enough hemoglobin. Okay, sending I mean, enough blood sending nutrients and oxygen to the kidneys. Understand? So you must make sure. And remember, when the patient produces urine, you will be the one smiling. Okay, okay, nah? All right. That's how important urination is. Okay. So next, after the bladder, we go down to what's next? Legs. What is important about the legs? DVT prophylaxis, something that's often overlooked, okay? Sometimes after the patient post resuscitation, after 24 hours, if it's indicated, we start patient on low molecular weight heparin to prevent the formation of DVT because patient is immobilized, okay? Immobilized, lying down, that itself is a risk factor for the formation of DVT. So you want to prevent DVT by... by and also the things that you can do is that you can put the patient on stockings, apply stockings to increase the contraction and also to raise the legs so that you prevent the formation of DVT. This is very important because if the DVT does form, it can lead to pulmonary embolism and this will further increase the morbidity and mortality of the patient. Okay? So, and there's also the last component. The last component is blood. Okay? But before that, let's recap. Okay? Let's start from head to toe. Then after that is blood. Okay? So let's recap again. Head is? Brain. 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 Sedation plus analgesia. Sedation, what do we start? Benzodiazepines such as midazolam, okay, and uh, analgesia, morphine. morphine. Give them on infusion, okay. Start infusion immediately. After brain, next is ice. what do we start in eyes? Ice. Put on CMC eye patches, okay. Make sure patient does not develop ulcerative keratitis, okay. Okay. What is next? Nose. What do you insert? Okay. Make sure that the patient, okay. So right still, okay. Mouth. Okay, secure the ETT tube. Okay, secure the ETT tube. What else you do? Connect to ATCO2 and the ventilator immediately. Okay. Okay, what is next? Chest. chest. What do you do in the chest? Three things. Chest X-ray. Okay, for the lungs, chest X-ray. After lungs is stomach. stomach. What do you do? Give proton pump inhibitors and then heart. ECG, echo, and ECG echo, one more thing, right? No. ECG and echo, right? Okay, okay, alright. ECG and echo. Okay, E. So, ECG and echo. Okay, then what is next? Arms. arms. What do you do about the arms? BP. BP. Okay. And make sure you address the BP immediately. Alright? Make sure the BP is stabilized. Next is? Hold the hands. Okay, hold the hands. Okay? So, what do you feel in the hands? Cold, clammy, pulse, skin turgor, CRT. Okay, and also insert the IV line. Start the patient on maintenance. If patient does not need any more fluid bolus, you start the patient. Don't forget to start the patient on maintenance. Okay, and then what else? Intra arterial line if needed. Okay, then after that, after the hands, you go to bladder. bladder. What are you supposed to do in the bladder? CBD. Insert the CBD and make adi ensure adequate urine output. And then next is legs. Okay, DVT prophylaxis. Okay, so DVT prophylaxis. Okay, and the last is. Blood. blood. Okay, let's go to blood. Okay. Yeah, off the monitor. Eh? Okay, now. Let's go to blood. Okay. So the last component of the post resuscitation care is blood. This now, you resuscitated the patient, correct? Did you send for blood when you resuscitated? Yes. Yes, you sent for blood when you resuscitated. So during your post resuscitation care, there are a few very important parameters that you need to check from your blood. There are a few very uh, important results that you need to check from your blood immediately because these results will determine whether the patient is going to collapse again or not. Okay? So what are the three results I'm talking about? Very important. Number one is blood sugar. Okay? Blood sugar. Your blood sugar okay, is very important. Please check the blood sugar post resuscitation. If the blood sugar is low, what are you supposed to do? Correct the blood sugar immediately. Either you give dextrose, okay, D50, 50, uh, D50, 30 cc, or you can start D10, okay? There are a few schools of thought. But make sure whatever you do, you need to bring the sugar back up, okay? Start on dextrose infusion if needed, okay? If the sugar is high, what do you do? Insulin. Yes, you want to give insulin, okay? You can give bolus insulin. You want to bring the 
you want to give bolus insulin but subcute. We are moving away from IV insulin, okay? You want to give the to start on subcute insulin, all right? In certain centers, critical care, they prefer to start IV insulin, okay? There are a lot of schools of thought, but in, in general, when the sugar is high, you want to start insulin and bring the sugar low because high sugar is also associated with what is the problem with high sugar? DK. Yes, there's chance to develop DKA or HHS. The serum osmolarity may be affected, and this will further impair the patient's mortality. All right? So address the sugar. Number two is potassium. Yes, you must check the potassium immediately post resus because the potassium could be a cause for patient to collapse. All right? So if the potassium is low, what are you supposed to do? Correct. Correct the potassium. Okay? Don't worry, another class on potassium correction, okay? But when the potassium is low, you want to correct it immediately. Either fast correction, depends on the level, or one gram over four hours, depends, okay? But you want to bring the potassium up because low potassium, hypokalemia will kill the patient because hypokalemia can trigger arrhythmias, life-threatening arrhythmias, okay? So you want to make sure that the patient does not go into an arrhythmia that can kill him. So make sure the potassium level, if it's low, correct it immediately, okay? If the potassium is high, is it good? Why is high potassium dangerous? Okay, same, it can cause you to go into arrest, okay? High potassium or low potassium can cause you to go into arrest, but high potassium can cause the heart to go into what? Okay, if the potassium is high, there will be tall tented T, all right? Then there will be prolonged PR interval, there will be pro pro prolonged QRS, then there'll be sine wave and patient can just become asystole, okay? Patient can go into cardiac arrest. So high potassium can also cause cardiac arrest based on the level of the potassium, okay? Please go back and learn that, okay? So high potassium, how are you going to treat? You want to give cardiac stabilizers. So what are you going to, how are you going to give cardiac stabilizers? What are you supposed to give when the potassium is high? Yes, okay, people call it like the cocktail, okay? Cardiac stabilizers. So you give calcium gluconate, stabilize the heart, increase the contractility, give uh, dextrose followed by insulin okay and you can give other ways of reducing the potassium you can give nap nebulized cyclotomol while waiting for the drugs to start okay some people even give bicarbonate but nowadays people do not advocate bicarbonate okay bicarbonate is like justin beaver We're trying to stay away from it okay all right okay and number three lactate. yes lactate very good thank you what is why do we look at the lactate of patients post resus what is so important about lactate Do you have lactate in your body? Yes. When does your body produce, produce lactate? Yes. When you're doing what? Yes. Not studying, huh? Okay. Okay, you really study, so there's not much lactate build up. It's alright, okay? Okay, sorry, I'm just kidding. Okay. So when you're doing exercise, lactate builds up. But is lactate bad for you? Yes. Okay, when you exercise, your body goes into anaerobic, okay? So because of that, the lactate is there's some lactate production, but that lactate will be converted into glucose back by your liver, all right? And because you're exercising, it is a normal physiological process to produce the lactate, okay? Of course, excessive can cause cramps. But for patient who is sleeping, is it normal for him to produce lactate? No. no. You do not produce lactate when you're sleeping. So when your lactate is climbing up, something is wrong. Why? What causes, what causes lactate to form? Anaerobic. Anaerobic metabolism. When you have enough perfusion in your body, enough oxygen, your cells are happy. So they start going into aerobic metabolism, okay? Aerobic, huh? aerobic metabolism. So they start doing some aerobic dance, they have aerobic metabolism. So 36 to 38 ATP is formed, okay? And this ATP is so important for all your body normal processes, okay? But now, when your body does not get enough perfusion, okay? For some reason, not enough perfusion, your body will start switching from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. And what is the problem with anaerobic metabolism? Instead of 36 ATP, now your body only produces 2 ATP, all right? And the lactic, the lactic itself is bad because it is acid. What happens when too much acid is accumulated? Acidosis. Is acidosis good for you? No. Is it good, is it good for you to be acidic? No. No, okay? Some people talk acidic things, right? Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, come on, huh? all right, okay. Okay, now, so it's not good to be acidic. Why? Your pH drops. And what happens when your pH drops? Is it good? No. What will happen? Enzymes stop working. When enzymes stop working, we are defined by the enzymes that work. If enzymes stop working, then you're good as dead. All right. So you want to prevent. This lactate is one of the good markers to tell us whether our resuscitation effort is good or not. All right. 
High lactate level does not mean that the patient is dying. It just means that the patient is compensating. All right? It just that means the patient is compensating and that we need to do something to bring the lactate level down. You don't want the patient to be in high lactate levels. It means that the patient is being in prolonged state of anaerobic metabolism. Understand? So what is the normal levels of lactate? Less than? 2. 2.0. Okay? If it starts climbing up, that is why lactate, we usually check serial lactate. One lactate does not mean, does not mean, I mean, it means jack shit. Okay? Sorry my language. Okay? Okay. <laughs> One lactate does not mean anything, all right? You need to see a serial lactate. If the lactate is like four, then three, then two, then four, then three, is the lactate levels okay? It's stable, it's quite okay, it's stable. Okay, it is climbing. <laughs> two, three, four, three, two, I mean, it's, it's okay. Because serially, you see, it's not climbing up, you know? Serially, you see, you see it's, it's two, then three, then four, then it's coming down, you know? Probably your resuscitation effort is good, so it is steady, all right? It's not, it's not ch changing so much, okay? Or it's coming out, beginning those four or three or two, that is good. But what if from 2, it becomes 4, it becomes 8, it becomes 16, okay? Then what happened? Increasing. What if it's increasing like your dad? What's happening? It means that patient is in shock. And the shock is persistent. And this time the lactate patient is in continuous anaerobic metabolism. So what are you going to do now? When somebody, nurse comes and shows you, Doctor, lactate, the lactate is going up. Now from 4 to 8 to 12. What am I going to do, doctor? What's your answer? <laughs> call for help. Okay, all right. Okay. Okay, call for help. Suddenly you see Superman flying down. Okay, all right. So what are you supposed to do? Okay, you need to bring the lactate down. You need to make sure that the anaerobic metabolism stop. Stop the anaerobic metabolism. Switch it back to anaerobic metabolism. Bring back the glory, glory songs of the 90s. Okay, all right. Now, how are you going to do that? You want to go back to the patient, as I said, examine him again. Examine him. Look at him again. Examine him from head to toe and find out why is he in persistent shock. Is it the heart? Okay, let's start from the top. Is it the lungs? Is there improper oxygenation? You want to see whether there's enough oxygen going in or not. Is there something wrong with the ET tube? Or is there enough, enough oxygen going in? Is there any problem with the lungs? Is there anything affecting the exchange? All right? Is there any ARDS or maybe there's fluid in his lungs? So you want to see the oxygenation first. Then go to the heart. Is there any problem with the heart? Is there any reason why the heart is not pumping enough oxygen to the peripheral cells? Look close at the heart. Find out, is there something wrong with the heart? Is it, is it not, uh, is, it, is there a failure of the heart to work as a pump? Then next, go to the circulation. Access him. Is he dehydrated? Is he in shock, hypovolemic shock? You need to give fluid, you need to give blood. Make sure there's enough oxygen and nutrients being sent to the peripheral cells. Understood? Understood. Or it could be an infection. Patient could be septic. There could be distributive shock. Blood is being trapped in the peripheries. Not enough oxygen is not enough blood is going back to the heart for oxygenation. It may sound tough. It may sound tough. But no matter what, at the end of the day, this results is only a guide. You have to touch the patient. Examine the patient. The patient can give you so much clues. And when you find the problem, you treat the problem immediately so that the lactate level comes down, you know that your resuscitation effort, whatever you're doing in your post-resuscitation care, is working. If it's not working, two things. Go back and re-examine, and always, as what you always say, call for help. Get somebody more senior to come, because there could be something that you are overlooking. Understand? Or call and get an expert opinion. Remember, always do not hesitate to call for help. Understand? Remember, as I said before, ego kills. When you come into the hospital, Check your ego at the front door. Throw your ego there and enter the, enter the department. Enter your hospital. Why? Because when you work, we work as a team. We want to help each other. All right? Yes, some superiors may be strict. They may scold you. They may be very harsh. But sometimes, that's just who they are. But we have to bear with it. Because in that scolding, there is learning. We learn from them a lot as well. Okay? And we will, we will appreciate what, what they, how they teach us as well. And you, when you get information, you teach others, okay? It's a never-ending cycle of teaching and learning, all right? And remember, when you are lost, you do not know how to deal with the patient, please call for help, okay? Call somebody, ask for help, do not have ego, because remember at the end of the day, ego will always kill a patient. Thank you. All right.